Okay, so we have the engine in the car and we have the transmission output hooked up to the rear wheels. All we have to do now is about 15 more things. We'll start with the fuel system. The easiest thing to do here is to just take the whole fuel tank off of the motorcycle and bolt it into the car. I've seen this done in a few motorcycle swaps and it seems to work out pretty well if you've got the space. You might have some problem with fuel slosh at low fuel levels because since motorcycles lean, they don't actually see any lateral acceleration. Another solution is to just get an aftermarket pump, filter, and fuel line and then just run it from your existing fuel tank to the engine. I kind of chose a more complicated path, which is I just built a whole new fuel tank. I did that because the fuel tank in the car was kind of old and rusted. And also I wanted to just use the whole fuel pump assembly from the motorcycle. Most motorcycles these days, if you take the fuel tank off and look at the bottom of it, there's this take off six bolts. You can pull out this whole assembly that's the filter, the regulator, the pump, the level sender. I just took that whole thing and put it into a new fuel tank. I recommend doing this or just adapting it to the existing fuel tank if you want to do that. Either way, it's pretty easy. It's already got the fuel flow and the pressure that you need. It's got the sender and the regulator. I noticed after I built mine that the fuel level sender is really high when I put it in my tank. So when I was like three quarters of a fuel tank, I would get the light on my dash saying I had low fuel. All I did was take the assembly out, find where that little sensor was, cut it off, and I drilled a tiny little hole and bolted it lower so it's about a quarter a tank. I also, of course, ran new fuel lines because the existing lines were 50 years old and too small anyway. The next thing we need to worry about is the exhaust. The existing header goes below the bottom of the engine, and since I was already sticking out of the top of the hood, I didn't want to move the engine up any higher, so I had to make a new exhaust. Also, if I used the stock header, it would have exited out the headlight. So what I did is I took the stock header and I cut it off just after the first downturn, and then I just bought some tube that was the same size, and I sort of just cut and welded and measured until I had something that looked kind of like a header. Once I had it all welded up, I had it ceramic coated. This helps keep the underhood temperatures down. If your car is anything like mine was, most of your exhaust is a rusted mess full of holes, part of which fell off in Arizona while you were towing at home. I just got rid of all of that stuff, and I took the muffler from the motorcycle that the engine came out of, and I bolted it into the back of the car, and then I just connected the header to the muffler with some exhaust tube. If you don't have a welder, any decent exhaust shop can do this for you. I originally just put the muffler right on the header, and that turned out to be a terrible idea because I was just huffing exhaust fumes every time I stopped at a stoplight. I built a new intake for this build pretty much entirely because the stock intake stuck out about a foot above the hood. For some reason, intakes on modern motorcycles are like 40% of the volume of the engine. They're huge. There was pretty much no way I could fit any size intake on this engine without cutting a hole in the hood, but I still didn't want it sticking up too high out of there, so I kind of compromised. It's about a third the size of the stock intake. Seems to work just fine. There are some velocity sacks in the intake that I had to take out, and I designed and 3D printed some shorter ones, but I had some fitment issues, and I honestly can't remember if I left them in or not. The intake is a total pain in the ass to get off, so I'm not going to check. We'll just assume they're in there. I made the intake by just designing it in CAD and then flattening it and then having it water jetted, bending it up and welding all the seams. If you're good with CAD and you have access to this stuff, I recommend it. It's a good way to do it. If not, you can do the other CAD, which is cardboard aided design, and you can just sort of piece it together with cardboard until it looks good, flatten it out, trace it on some aluminum, sharpie it out, cut it, fold it, and weld it. The air filter is a dual inlet pod filter. I did this just so I could have a larger area, and then I just blocked off one of the inlets. So for driver controls, the throttle attachment is straightforward because it's just a push-pull cable on the motorcycle and the car. I replaced the cable with a new one. I just went to a bicycle shop and bought all the stuff and then made my own. I have an adjustable hard stop in there that's just a big bolt bolted to the firewall. It's important to do this because if you mash the throttle all the way down, you want to have some sort of positive stop that's not just stretching the cable. If you don't put the hard stop in there, whenever you mash the throttle, you might break the cable and that's going to prevent you from doing sick burnouts while leaving cars and coffee and sliding sideways into a crowd of people like an impossibly stupid teenager. Also, the throttle plates on this engine went a little past wide open, so I had to put a stop in there to make sure wide open throttle was actually wide open throttle. The clutch is a little more difficult or super easy, depending on what setup you have. The car came with a hydraulic clutch and so did the motorcycle, but the master cylinder on the car was, again, 50 years old, and I didn't know if the bore was set up for the slave cylinder that was on the motorcycle. 
So my solution for this is actually one of my favorite parts about this car. I just took a motorcycle clutch master cylinder and put it on the shift lever. I ride motorcycles a lot, so I have that feel for the, my fingers on the clutch, so I can modulate this pretty well, and it's just the best. If you have a cable activated clutch on your motorcycle engine, you probably just have to do the same thing with a throttle, but with the clutch cable. So for gauges, if you're carrying over the stock ECU, this is super easy. You just take the gauge cluster off the motorcycle, shove it in the car somewhere. That's what I did. It's awesome. Works out great. I kind of wanted to adapt the existing gauges in the car, but they're all these old mechanical gauges and I would have had to take them apart and redesign like some sort of stepper motor mechanism for it. And I just didn't really want to spend the time or the effort. If you're trying to make the car look stock, that would be super cool, but it's probably not super easy. You can also spend a bunch of money on cool looking aftermarket gauges if that's what you're into. You can buy a speedometer correction that will fix the fact that you've changed all the final drive ratio. They're like 75 bucks and they're pretty easy to set up. Okay, almost there, seriously. One more thing, cooling, keeping the engine cool. It's important to keep the engine cool. The two different approaches you can have on this are to use the radiator that came with the car which is super easy, or use the radiator that came with a motorcycle, which is a little more difficult. I took a third option, which is I just bought the widest radiator that would fit in the car, and then I just cut the bottom off of it and welded caps on it for the maximum height in the car. So basically, I just have the whole frontal area with a big aluminum radiator. It's more cooling than it needs, but that's better than not enough cooling. So as far as plumbing it all together, go to your local auto parts store and tell them what you're doing. They love this sort of stuff. And ask them if you can go in the back and just look around at the hoses they have. Find the hoses that have the diameter you need and buy a bunch that have a bunch of bends in them. Get some unions and clamps and go back and just sort of cut and piece it together until it works. You'll want to mount the hose to the body every eight inches or so so it's not flopping around a bunch. You might also need to shorten the oil pan. This actually needs to happen first if you need to do this. A lot of modern motorcycle engines have a really tall sump. The motor in this car was another maybe five inches taller and that was just way too tall because obviously it's already sticking out of the hood. So I took the oil pan off and I chopped off the sump. Make sure you measure how much you cut off because there's also a pickup in the engine that you need to shorten by the same amount. On some engines, you can also just buy an aftermarket dry sump system. Um, I believe the Hayabusa has this. In fact, as a side note, if you're the type of person that likes to buy a bunch of aftermarket stuff to solve your problems, you probably wanna go with the Hayabusa. There's a huge aftermarket for all sorts of stuff for it. I also added a baffle between the engine and the pan. This is good because like the fuel tank, the motorcycle leans so it doesn't have the lateral acceleration, but in the car, of course you do. This baffle will keep the oil from sloshing around too much and make sure you'll always have oil at the pickup. So funny story, when I first tried to shorten the pan, I cut the bottom off and I got an aluminum plate and traced it out and I tried to weld the aluminum plate onto the pan and it wasn't welding for some reason. I kept getting a pool going and then it would just crack open and I thought maybe the casting was bad, but then I remembered that motorcycle manufacturers sometimes make things like oil pan out of magnesium. So you just watched a whole video of advice from a guy who tried to weld aluminum to a magnesium oil pan. Good luck. If you're curious, I bought a magnesium plate cut it to size, and then I cut some thin strips off of it and use that as filler, TIG welding it together. I brought it into work and some of the fabrication guys and I welded it because none of us had ever welded magnesium before. We had a class D fire extinguisher right there just in case, but nothing caught on fire. Okay, we're done with the powertrain, but we need to talk about the stop train. Brakes are one of those things that are easy to forget. Dodge forgot them on the first and second generation Viper. They built a car with a stupidly huge engine and then took brakes from a Plymouth Laser and put them on the car. This supports my theory that the Viper was designed entirely by a team of clinically insane 12 year olds. As mentioned earlier, this project used stock Miata brakes, which seem a little small except for this car weighs 1300 pounds, so they're plenty good. In fact, I would call them performance brakes for this application. Since I used the Miata uprights, mounting the actual rotors and calipers was trivial. The master cylinder was a little more difficult. I had to make a mount for it and get the leverage right. I added an adjustable proportioning valve because I'm sure the Miata proportioning valve is not set up for an entirely different setup. I bought some new brake line, flared it, ran it through the car, and I'm good to go. There's no power brakes, but it's totally fine on a car this light. I'd probably think about doing power brakes if I was above about 17, 1800 pounds. Okay, that's it, we're good to go. We got it installed, we got it hooked up to the wheels, we got the fuel, the exhaust, the driver interface. All we gotta do now is supercharge it. <laughs> Seriously though, don't do this. It's uh, frowned upon by the Tesla staff. 
That is but one way to put a motorcycle engine in a car. Actually, several ways. I talked about a bunch of different stuff. But a lot of people have done this before. There's a lot of resources. The Formula SAE competition has a lot of stuff. Um, there's the low cost, which I talked about, uh, both US and UK forums. A lot of those guys put motorcycle engines in cars. There's a lot of really good info there. In fact, there's a lot of British people that like to shove motorcycle engines in cars. I'm not sure why, but a lot of good info on the other side of the pond. There's a lot of ideas out there. Just remember, some of them are bad ideas. Okay, questions I get. A lot of people wonder about the transmission. Is it capable of hauling around 1,300 pounds of car and 200 pounds of me? Well, it's probably not going to last 100,000 miles, but maybe after 15,000 miles it explodes. That's just your car's way of telling you it's time to put in a bigger, better engine and transmission. Is it legal? What are you, a cop? So this is a 1964, so it's emissions exempt, um, but I did retain all of the emission stuff that I took off of the motorcycle. Uh, also as a 64, it was before the Eisenhower Highway Safety Act, so I don't even think I need seat belts. I'm not really sure on that in California specifically, but one of the nice things about having an older car is you really only have to meet the requirements of the year it was made, and there were pretty much no requirements in 1964. A lot of people want to know how much money I spent. I hate keeping track of this sort of stuff, but it was probably around $10,000. Um, I used to say somewhere between five and 10, but the more I think about it, it's probably closer to 10. Recently, I've thrown a few thousand dollars at it. I put a reverse box in it, that was a thousand bucks. Um, I had the, the angles on the differential recut, that cost me like 500 bucks. So there's a few things here and there that are adding some price, but it's basically a racing go-kart that has a license plate on it. So it's pretty cheap for what I got. It's not super safe. It's not generally very comfortable, but if that's what you're looking for, you're probably watching the wrong video. If you liked this video, you're probably gonna like some of my other questionable ideas, so hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up. But before you go, shortly after I finished this car, I was hot rodding around the canyons of Los Angeles and I ran into none other than Jay Leno. He awesomely invited me to be on his YouTube show, so if you enjoyed this video, you will definitely enjoy this video. Give it a click. Again, thanks for watching.